Um, really fun to be here with you all. I feel sort of instantly energized in this room with such great company. In a circle. In a circle, too. <laughs> um, so I'm Pamela Schwartz, uh, one of the um, coordinators, I guess, organizers of Yes Northampton. Let me introduce our uh, other compatriots who have made this meeting happen tonight, and that is Jane Fleischman and Dorothy Nimitz and Joel Feldman. Um, so we are, I am welcoming all of you on their behalf. And I know many of you have such core Yes Northampton stuff in your lives, and thank you, and it's so awesome to see you. Um, so uh, let me start by introducing our elected officials. And we have such a wonderful room full. Um, welcome to Senator Rosenberg and Representative Coca. Thank you for being here. Our fair mayor, David Nargoyne, thank you. Uh, we've got a nice, um, city, a nice collection of city councilors here. And uh, let, me, let me start with Ward 6 City Councilor Marianne Labarge. Uh, Ward 3 City Councilor Ryan O'Donnell. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, Ward 4 City Councilor Gina Louise Chiara. So happy you're here in this capacity. Um, we have Register of Deeds, Mary Olberding. Uh, we have School Committee Member, Blue Duval. Our communities. We've worked on it as part of Yes Northampton. That's out there. Um, 
we know we need to um, map out a plan and that, that has a, a vision, that has a multi-year vision, and then we are prepared as part of Yes Northampton with all of us together to provide the support to our elected leaders to implement that plan. And so we're here really as a starting point for this next chapter, post-override, post-preservation of the core of what makes our city great. And now we're in the how do we keep protecting it? And we, we did make a commitment and we believe in it that we can't do another override. We, we can't ask. We can't ask our community to keep going back to this resource when we know the real solutions are elsewhere. And we are prepared to do everything we can, and again, we ask you, and we know you're here as part of that commitment, to make sure that happens. And so we turn to Senator Rosemary Gretchen Cocott as our representative leaders in the state to say, we are so thankful for your support of progressive tax reform, and we are so counting on you for continued leadership and for being out front on this and knowing that we have your back and that we are prepared to do whatever it takes that you advise us to do in addition to our own brainstorm to make it happen. And so this is, again, the start of that conversation. So with that, I would love to turn it over to you to, again, paint your picture in a few minutes' time of where, of just, again, laying that foundation for this conversation about what does it take for us to do our part in order for you to best enable to do yours around leadership on this issue. Okay. <laughs> so there are a number of moving pieces here and uh, you have to connect the dots here. Um, and I'm just gonna go in kind of rapid fire. Um, the, there is a constitutional amendment pending to do the graduated income tax we tried five other times in the, in the latter half of the um, 20th century. It failed each time, but we've refiled it again. It's been 1994 or six, the last time it was on the ballot. So some of us believe we have to go down that path and try to change the Constitution. Unfortunately, that's a four year long process. So that is not going to give you immediate relief but that should be on your agenda and on your radar screen. Number two, um, there was a commission to look at the tax expenditure budget, which means the deductions, credits, and exemptions that are contained within the tax law in Massachusetts, with an eye toward figuring out which have outlived their usefulness in a progressive tax uh, system which, as you know, we don't basically have a progressive tax system because we have constitutional prohibition on that. But we jimmy the income tax and the sales tax to make it a little bit more progressive. But what could we take away from the tax expenditure budget, which is substantially larger amount of revenue than the total amount of revenue we actually collect? So there's a lot of opportunity if we have the backbone, the courage, the vision to figure out which piece not to get rid of. And we could get billions and billions of dollars of new revenue without touching um, tax rates. That report is out, it's available. You can read it online, you can educate yourself on it, and come to your own conclusions about which are the best targets. A second commission is going to be releasing a report within the next 60 to 90 days it's a uh, commission on progressive uh, tax policy, and it was formed as a result of a piece of legislation that was approved about four months ago. It's one of the few commissions that actually got up and running on time, and looks like it might actually report on time, and it would be within this calendar year, within this fiscal year, which could then be considered in a number of venues, including the upcoming election, which is moving piece number four in this picture, which is we're going to have candidates running for governor, traveling the state, looking for our votes and our support. So engaging in a real conversation with them about what they'll be willing to do starting in January of 2015 with their uh, governorship to help improve the progressivity of the tax system. That's uh, something 
quicker than the graduated income tax, closer to now, um, and it could include proposals that come out of either of those two reports that I've already referenced as number two and number three. So there are already some very concrete things that we can do as uh, voters, as taxpayers, as uh, residents of the state to uh, work together to try to shape a more progressive tax system and then to build the political support to uh, carry that out. The um, reality is that uh, we are in an election year. The, it is the short year of the election of the legislative uh, session, of, of the legislative term. So by midnight, July 31st, we have to complete all formal sessions of the legislature. So you have between now and July 31st if you want to try to get something passed by the legislature. Um, my prediction is that you will see no tax bills coming out of the tax committee. Therefore, the only vehicle you will have that you can use is the budget. And under the rules of, uh, under the Constitution and the rules of the legislature, um, all uh, money bills must begin in the House. So the pressure would then be on the House to come up with a tax package and put it in the budget. The Speaker, and I'm not going to speak for the Speaker, but I will tell you he has said publicly, repeatedly, that he does not envision taking up any taxes in this calendar year. Peter can provide additional information on that when he gets to his presentation. The Senate then is blocked from taking up any taxes. This isn't a strategy of pointing and saying, make them do it. It's just the reality of the situation that we're in an election year. We just had one of the ugliest tax debates that we've had in all the years I've been in the legislature. We wanted a billion dollars. The governor filed a package for 1.9 billion, which was 900 million more than we had all been discussing for the previous two years, and he did a fantastic tax reform package, which if this were an academic exercise, he should get an A++++. But the problem was it was not an academic exercise, it was a political exercise, and basically it croaked our ability to even reach a billion dollars. And that is just an unfortunate, harsh reality of the politics of the situation. So what we were able to come up with was about $800 million. And that $800 million included $300 million that was already being collected that was going to be reallocated for other functions in the transportation uh, sphere. Um, and the largest new revenue source was the software tax, which upon signature by the governor of that tax, the software industry woke up and said, we didn't think you'd really do this. <laughs> and they went apoplectic, and we ended up having to repeal it because it was, uh, it could not be actually implemented the way we wrote it, because we were trying to narrow it to a, about 160 million. And it, they, the, uh, the tax regulators could not figure out how to do that and, and make it work and make it fair, so it got repealed. So we went from 800 down to about, um, what, 640? So um, it's, it was a problematic exercise in year, <coughs> and it was our opportunity for this term to, uh, to really do something about it. I'll end on what is a little bit more hopeful uh, note, and that is that we're going through the customary uh, process of determining what the revenue projection should be for the next fiscal year. And because the economy keeps improving slowly but surely, I think uh, as someone who went through that process for a few years when I was at Ways and Means, my reading of the tea leaves is it's going to be a little bit better than you've seen in the last couple of years. So it's going to be a little bit more. I'm not going to say it's going to be a lot more, but it's going to be a little bit more. And I know you will mostly hate this, but uh, it, the likelihood is that there will also be some revenues generated as a result of the uh, gaming bill for the FY15 budget. 
and um, uh, a substantial portion of that would be earmarked for local aid, so it would be a help to the communities, and um, some of it's one time, but should be able to be replaced with permanent um, gaming revenues as the facilities actually open, because the first money is licensing, but future money is, uh, is actually a tax on the gaming. So um, I think you will see a slightly better year in terms of what we're able to do. And local aid is always a priority in the budget. It's even more of a priority during an election year. And so I, um, I suggest that we have, if we work uh, hard on that, we have a better shot of producing something of value uh, given that your objective is to increase local aid in order to support local public services and even as we continue to plan for the future uh, in terms of trying to uh, generate support for progressive taxation. And my final word is that the newest element, and I think it's a, becoming a very powerful element, is the growing conversation about income inequality mm -hmm. and the massive increases of wealth in the top uh, 1 to 5 percent, but particularly the top 1 percent, and Massachusetts has the single most disproportionate income inequality in the country. We are the third highest per capita income, and that is an opportunity that um, allows us, if we can convince the public, that we can uh, re re review and revise and make more progressive our tax system without killing the golden goose that lays the golden egg um, and not um, uh, raising taxes on the lowest two-thirds of the population whose income has stagnated for the last 40 years. It's my final word. Thank you. Thank you. Any of you who were here last year at this event um, saw me, I think right about where Marianne is sitting, standing up, looking out towards the crowd that way. And I had my, my, my pad up, up about this far. I didn't have my glasses with me. Um, and so it became sort of a, an effort to really guess what I had written. And so this year, I have my glasses and you know multiple documents, and Pamela has cut the time of this event down to an hour. So I think that basically means that I can't go through all this stuff. Um, let, me, um, let me thank you for this, first of all. Let me also say that one of the most ardent lobbyists for um, education aid and, and local aid and local funding is here tonight, Barbara Black, who oh, constantly yeah. lobbies. Yeah. Yeah. So you have, you, have, you have a very good lobbyist that is working not in Boston, but in Northampton all the time on your behalf. So um, let me go from sort of the, the macro level down to sort of 1,000 feet or 500 feet and just talk about some numbers. and. Let's go back to last year again. Um, when I stood there, I think the Gila Hampshire uh, headline was, Colcott will raise taxes. <laughs> and uh, that's not what I said. I think someone asked if, if there's going to be a tax vote, will you vote for taxes? I said, yes, of course. So here's the roll call. It's right here. We have a proof. And let me just talk about that vote a little bit. Um, because that really tells a lot about sort of the lay of the land, um, in, in the House at least. Um, as you recall, um, Governor Patrick had proposed a $2 billion tax package. And the political environment of that was, um, my recollection, was that it was sort of announced and, and dropped on us without a great deal of vetting and conversation among legislators and legislative leaders. And I don't think I'm far off on that. So then we had to you know, try to cobble together the political support to give him support and, and to try to make this a win. Ultimately, um, when you look at this vote, um, this vote was 106 yes, 47 no for the $500 million tax plan. Even within that vote, 15 Democrats voted off. In between the time that Governor Patrick filed that, that uh, very, very big tax plan, $2 billion, and the passage of this bill. An effort was undertaken um, by the Campaign for Our Communities, many labor unions, the MTA, progressive Democrats, 
to try to get support for the bill. And that included looking at the Scott Brown, Elizabeth Warren election, the Martha Coakley, Scott Brown election, and focusing in on those legislative districts where Elizabeth Warren had done better than Martha, Co Martha Coakley by a substantial amount. And then looking at those Democratic legislators within those districts to try to see if we could gather support from them. So there were a, a series of meetings. Uh, we met with Governor Patrick on numerous occasions and an effort uh, uh, was put forth to try to convince those Democratic legislators in those districts that we, that we had identified that should have been supportive of, the, of this concept to actually tell the Speaker of the House that they were in fact going to support a larger number. At the end of that process, there were approximately 20 House members that were in support of the $2 billion number. Okay, so after that entire effort, we had 20 Democratic House members that were willing to tell the Speaker of the House that they were going to vote for that higher number. So clearly, politically, that higher number was not going to work. So what we ended up with was a $500 million package, and, and you've all heard this before, the increase in the gas tax, the, the increase in the tax on cigarettes, uh, the software tax, and then a few little minor tweaks on tolls and other revenues. Um, as was mentioned, um, after the software tax piece was signed into law, we started hearing from software folks. And we really never heard opposition to any of that prior to that point. <coughs> so throughout the entire spring, leading into the actual signing of the bill, there was no um, uh, pressure, there was no pushback from the software industry that this was a bad idea. So we're talking about about $160 million. So it came to a point where not only the software industry, but the MTA, uh, mass taxpayers, said that this would be a really bad idea. So that tax was pulled back. So let me just talk for a minute about the numbers, the revenue numbers that we're looking at this year based upon that tax increase and other things that have happened in the last couple of years. Um, and these numbers are from the Mass Taxpayers Association and um, they come out of the, the uh, Revenue Department and some uh, hearings that have already taken place this past winter. So, uh, state tax collections this fiscal year could grow by as much as 4.8%. Um, that's up from 3% that were estimated last year. These collections in FY14 may exceed estimates by as much as $470 million. Tax revenue growth in fiscal 2015 will accelerate up to 5.2%. Even the Beacon Hill Institute, which is a very conservative think tank in Boston, has estimated that uh, taxes next year, revenues next year, will go up by 5.3%. Um, those revenues, and so we're talking about $1.1 billion in new revenues, fixed costs, employee pensions, debt service, and Medicaid, we predict will eat up that entire $1.1 billion. So that revenue news on its face, which sounds great, is a wash. Uh, Job growth, we're predicting about 53,000 more jobs next year. But what's happened is, as Massachusetts came out of the economic crisis faster than virtually every other state, now our growth is slowing and other states have caught up to us. So that last year's sort of, you know, that gap from Massachusetts to the rest of the country, that gap has now closed. So with that $1.2 billion in new collections next year, let me just briefly break down what that relates to. Roughly 34, pardon me, roughly 35% of all the revenues that we collect goes to subsidized health care. Local aid and education are about 15%. And overall, 75% of the revenues that we collect support health care, human services, and education, and about 12% allocated for fixed debt and pension costs. Positive news is that lottery funds 
will be up next year. And it's likely that that first license for a uh, casino will probably happen in the fall sometime. And you'll have more revenues coming into our coffers from that. But let me just shift a little bit off of taxes for a moment. And let me just talk about really quickly two issues that are going to have a substantial impact on how much money is available for local aid. Um, and these numbers are really startling. Um, let me talk a little bit about health care costs. And, you know, this is a, a, a state that probably has some of the best hospitals in the world, um, great doctors, great access. We, we have been successful in ensuring over 97% of the population here. Um, and as part of last year's bill to control health care costs, uh, we established a uh, health policy commission. This commission now has a mandate of constantly assessing health care costs. And what they do is they use the medical claims data from the all-payer claims database. <coughs> this is kind of technical, but I, it's pretty important. Let me just briefly touch on what they have found this year. In the year 2012, 21 to 39%, which means 14.7 billion to 26.9 billion of healthcare expenditures in Massachusetts were wasteful. Specific examples of waste include $700 million in preventable hospital readmissions, $550 million in unnecessary emergency visits, 10 to 18 million in healthcare um, uh, uh, um, outcomes that, that, that uh, weren't property, were proper. And when you look at the cost of healthcare, if you talk to the mayor of Northampton or any other mayor, they will let you know that healthcare costs are eating up any new revenues. And so this is an issue that we, we're going to really have to focus on next year. The other issue is the cost of former employees' health care costs. And I'm not sure what the numbers are um, in, uh, 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 here, but statewide, virtually every community has a unfunded liability for their former employees that's in the hundreds of millions across our commonwealth. And I think this year, uh, Governor Patrick's bill to look at this issue is going to be incredibly you know, key for all of us. And I'll leave it at that. We can move on to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very informative. Great way to lead the So Jane is going to adopt her fabulous role as a fabulous moderator. Um, and um, I'll let you do the the no question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Short, 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 yeah. short, 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 these include uh, New York City, Washington, Baltimore, Kansas City, St. Louis, Philadelphia, and so forth. Um, that's because they're in states that allow uh, a city to have a, an income tax. And I'm not talking about a large income tax, something like 1% or 1.5%. However, Massachusetts is one of the states, one of four, only four states, that does not allow a city to levy its own taxes. And that's because it's in the state constitutions. So, however, we can levy a local tax um, if the legislature approves it, gives us permission to do that. Now, of course, they did that with the uh, three quarters of a percent meals tax, which uh, Northampton instituted. And I think it's generating six or seven hundred thousand dollars of income. I'm not really sure. David could tell us uh, per year. That's just on the measly little. 
three quarters of a percent on meals eaten out. So um, this one, one or one and a half percent city income tax could actually generate a large amount of money. So I would like to ask our legislators, legislators uh, why it is, and I'm sure there's good reasons, that the legislature does not permit more cities and towns in our state to levy local taxes. Why would you assume there's a good answer? <laughs> Other good answers. Um, you have uh, rightly said that under the Constitution in Massachusetts, all taxing authority actually rests with the state. And the state can and does delegate taxing authority within limited prescribed uh, areas to the cities and towns. And in recent years, we've added three new ones, uh, one that doesn't apply to Northampton jet fuel, one that does hotels, and another that does um, uh, meals. Some communities have debated, and um, uh, I can't remember if any of them act have actually sent a home rule petition to the state, but that would force the conversation and the debate at the state level. Well, is, is this something you could instigate as opposed to just a citizen? Uh, yes, legislators can file enabling legislation, and um, I don't know of anyone who has. So it's a possibility. You're not a it's a possibility. Well, but that's the point. If it's just in Northampton, it has to be a home rule petition requested by the city. Yeah. So the city council and the mayor so that's option one. Option two is to ask legislators to file it, and um, maybe you'll find a legislator who's interested in doing that. <laughs> maybe we will. <laughs> maybe we'll find a legislator. Jonah. Could uh, one or both of you speak for a second about the history of Proposition 2 and a half and the viability of its being repealed or reformed in such a way to allow the city to more fairly levy property taxes based perhaps on a, a more rational assessment based on prices that get paid in the marketplace rather than restricting everyone to the same percentage increase uh, that is currently uh, stipulated. I didn't, we didn't even plant that question. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Proposition 2.5 was put in about 25 or 6 years ago. I think it was voted in 1981, went into effect in 82 or 83. And there's only been one substantive change made in the entire uh, period of time since then, and that was to change the override for um, the operating budget from a two-thirds majority to a simple majority, and that was legislation that I filed as a freshman state representative. And uh, no other uh, proposal for amending it has passed uh, since. Uh, the probability of repealing it is slightly better than my growing a new head of hair. <laughs> and the possibility of amending it um, is very, very slim uh, because those efforts that have been made, other than the one I described, have all failed over time. Have there been any substantive efforts to amend it on the level of fairness in the past? You know? Yes, that was the the the, uh, the one that passed, which was going from two thirds majority to simple majority, because operating budgets are a simple majority vote in all forms of government, and the capital is a two thirds vote. I just want to interject that we are taking good notes on these excellent questions, and there's no uh, thank you because we're uh, thank you to you all for because you are generating our the stuff that will fuel our follow-up conversations with all of us together. I do think we're going to follow up with looking for good legislators who can <laughs> sponsor something that comes out of this project. I just want to follow up on something. We'll do a worldwide search for a good legislator. <laughs> 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 something that was raised earlier about the, the hotel and meals tax. I remember when we had this meeting a year ago, one of the things that came up, and it was certainly news to me, we are, at least a lot of us who voted for that when it was on the ballot, thought that money was going to stay in Northampton and found out that a lot of that, that it goes to the state and then we get a percentage of it back. Um, you're nodding, you're shaking your head. Well, the meal tax 
that you vote on, all of it stays here. Okay. The state meals tax, it goes to Boston and gets redistributed through the budget. And originally it was focused on education. And if you take the whole education budget, pre-K through 12, uh, including building schools, more than the sales tax comes back for K through 12. So you are getting the full amount back. The citizens are getting the full amount for education back to the communities, but it's based on formulas. Okay. I'm sorry I'm late. Um, I wondered what is the possibility of increasing the statewide income tax and uh, corporate tax? The likelihood of increasing the statewide income tax is reflected in this roll call, which I showed in one earlier. Um, in the House of Representatives, I would say right now there's probably about 20 votes in favor of any major tax increase. Um, so likelihood, the likelihood is not high. And Governor Patrick last week, um, when questioned about uh, his uh, FY 2015 budget indicated that he would not include any new tax <coughs> proposals. What about corp corporate tax? Corporate tax, I think that's a little more interesting. The Tax Fairness Commission, uh, which was Section 77 of last year's budget, I think proposed by Karen Spoka in the Senate, um, specifically is asked, asked and looking at um, tax fairness across the Commonwealth. When you look at the major tax breaks that are out there, the four largest ones would include some, some, some look at corporate taxes. But, and it's interesting, when you look at Massachusetts corporate taxes in comparison to other states, we are very, very low. So you're not gonna get as big a bump out of that as, as, as if, uh, for instance, if you looked at the single sales factor for manufacturing or for uh, financial services, for instance. So right now, if you're a man, if you're manufacturing firm in Massachusetts and you sell a missile system to Israel, you, we don't get any taxes based on that. If you're a financial services company and you sell a product outside of Massachusetts, we don't get any taxes from that. And so we'd like to look at uh, a, a, a fairness uh, provision in that tax code, and you've got some corporations that aren't paying state taxes anywhere on their sales. Um, so we'd like to look at, 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 at those instances and see if we can claw back those taxes back here in Massachusetts. And so that Tax Fairness Commission uh, has a mandate to report by, I think it's March 14th of this year, and that's good for us because the House will start talking about the next fiscal year in April, so we'll have you know, their information and recommendations at that time. But Peter, I'm confused. This is not the Progressive Tax Policy Commission that's doing this, I think. This is the, the, the tax is the same. It's yeah. called tax The Tax Fairness I Commission. I didn't use terminology. That's okay. It was uh, Section 77. It was an initiative out of the Senate. So, uh, great. Somebody's yeah, I have a, uh, a question. You described how little support there is in the House, the, the, the low numbers of people who voted on, on this. Uh, let's assume for the sake of discussion uh, that David and all of the mayors in the state of Massachusetts, the Democratic state of Massachusetts, had an opportunity to vote. How would a vote come out among the mayors of the state. I know that's not the way the law works, but I'm just curious to see if there's a difference between state representatives and senators and mayors. Yeah, well, so for instance, and, and I'm not going to speak you know, as a mayor or, or, or around his behalf, but we are invited every year, the MMA invites legislators to uh, forums across Massachusetts. I mean, last year was up in Wheatley, and, and, it, and it moves around out here. And the last two events, I and my colleagues have asked, is the MMA in favor of this tax increase or this tax proposal? Um, and um, I don't think we've ever gotten an affirmative answer, or more importantly, during that effort that I, that I talked about earlier, where we met with progressives and the MTA and all these groups trying to um, 
convince legislators to sort of um, uh, work with us. The MMA did not participate in those meetings. And I think what that reflects is many communities are fiscally conservative. Many legislators, even though they have you know, D's, are fiscally conservative. Um, and to try to change the way that those folks vote, it takes an effort, you know, family to family. You know, it's, it's, it's each town. And it's an effort that's really a political campaign. And that, I think, is some of the work that has to branch out from here. It's, we tried that effort top down. We tried it with the governor and, and large interest groups and you know, unions trying to put pressure on legislators, and it didn't work. So I think at this point, that organization has not been really um, part of a real strong advocacy for major tax increases, at least. I think one of the tests of this would be to check out and see how many communities have voted for the uh, local option meals tax. My guess is the majority of communities have not voted to do it. That's my guess, but I don't know for sure. And I think that's an indication, and that's even much smaller. Um, so. and, and actually, no, I'm just going to say I think the groups you were talking about were groups of selectmen. That, that was not a group of mayors. Okay, yeah. uh, Correct. It was more select ones from small Correct. a lot of the towns that you represent. So Correct. Yeah. True. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and Western Mass mayors, not our mayor, but Western Mass mayors, um, when asked in the past if they would support uh, advocating on behalf of a meals tax increase or a gas tax increase, relatively few of them have been advocates. Um, I'm kind of new to this whole thing, and I was kind of thinking of the state level, the local level, and the home. And my concern was for education or school spending. And I heard that the state keeps cutting back school aid and, and, and aid to the cities and towns. And I was wondering if they've been doing this for years and we've lost all this money or it's been level funded every year. Uh, how did the state expect the cities to actually make up with that? Is that where the two and a half override came from? They must have had some plan of what we were supposed to do to make up these deficits. The second thing I'm thinking of is in Northampton, we have a very unique uh, school structure. We have a deaf school, we have a vocational school, there was school choice. And I've heard that although we're a wonderful community af offering all these services, that somehow on collecting fees for students who go to the schools in Northampton, it somehow has impacted us not so positively. So I was wondering, you know, um, if anything has come with, with maybe with that, how they're determining the dollars per student or whatever. And on the third level, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, hmm, you know, I'm supposed to go home to my two daughters and tell them that basically mommy's got to go out and go to the casino and buy some lottery tickets because <laughs> the um, state has recommended that we raise tax dollars by sin tax, although there was gas tax and tolls but I think it was lottery tickets, casino, and smoking, cigarette tax. Um, that's not really something I really want to share with my kids at 11:14. But um, you know, could you, could you please help me out with this? <laughs> Aid to schools is up this year. Chapter 70 is up. And you know, part of our problem is we have been trying to deal with a worldwide economic problem. You know that roots go back to Wall Street and the lack of oversight and all, and all those things. And so since 2008 or so, we have been trying to deal with this crisis. And what, you know, so in our approach has been cuts, new taxes, and trying to use revenues that we get one time creatively. The ultimate arbiter of our success in this effort uh, is not us, it's rating agencies like Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch's that rate our bonds. So when our bonds are, on, are, are out there on Wall Street and we're trying to uh, produce, uh, uh, you know, these agencies rate our performance and consistently these agencies have looked at, 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 at Massachusetts and our performance and have increased 
the quality of our bonds up to uh, AA++ at this point. So in comparison to virtually every other state, our approach in facing these uh, crises was pretty good. Um, as far as trying to you know, get more revenues, um, when you move outside of Northampton, Amherst, Cambridge, Lexington, Arlington, and a few other towns, the, the um, nature of the folks who live there are much more conservative. That job of trying to raise more revenues is really tough. So. Let me add a couple of quick thoughts to this. Start in the early 80s with Proposition 2 and a half. When Proposition 2 and a half was voted in and the economy was doing very well at that point in Massachusetts, the response of the state government was to dramatically increase local aid over about an eight or so year period. During that period, President Reagan was convincing the company, country you can have services and not pay for them. So the federal government was starting at that point and continuing even until today to reduce funding to the states and to the municipalities. So in that first decade after Prop 2 and a half, we were increasing state aid even as pressure was growing to replace federally cut dollars to the states. The next decade was the decade of proposition of um, education reform. We doubled support for education during that eight year period. So local aid was continuing to grow overall. Northampton, because it was caught in this little warp in the formula, too rich to get big benefit and too poor to be able to get enough from the uh, local residents to be able to do what they wanted in their education system. So now I've covered two decades of dramatic increase from the state for local aid, including and especially for education aid. Then the education reform was over and under the, under the state law, we had an obligation to meet inflation on the state portion and the communities had to meet inflation on their portion. We started to also add per pupil $25 or $50 because it wasn't, it wasn't quite enough and we were trying to be a little bit more generous. That went on for about six or seven years. Then we hit another recession and every time we hit a recession, local aid is the last thing to be cut, but in these deep recessions, we always end up cutting local aid. And so we're now just coming out of the recession, so as best we can, in the context of what Peter laid out of the amount of growth in revenue against our fixed obligations that are growing, we will be trying to increase local aid more. And then that's what brings us to the conversation about can we increase state revenues enough to be able to give uh, substantially more to the communities or can we give you more taxing authority so you could do it yourself. And, and you fix the formula to, to and that, not enough to, you know. And that formula from uh, 1993 was based on a lawsuit, was done very, very quickly, never dealt with special ed, never dealt with schools like Smith School. And so now gradually we're trying to get back and backfill some funds to like those areas. We got time for one. Slow we got time for one quick question and one quick answer, or two quick answers. Have a, um, one second. Please we have So just um, you've talked about local aid and, and school funding, and I just want to focus on um, the circuit breaker program because it's a sort of separate pool of money. And um, Northampton, in the last seven years, has had our out of district placements, which usually is for high need special education students, growing at eight and a half percent a year. That's more than twice all of our other um, educational. Um, revenue or spending needs. And so um, the circuit breaker program, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, funds 75% of the costs that are over four times the state's foundation budget. So I'm wondering, um, and this was cut to 40% actually during the worst years of the recession. So this would be a way, $200 million in the state budget, if more was appropriated, it would target 
education funding and target a rapidly growing area of education funding, um, you know, either changing the 75% to a higher percentage or perhaps reducing the threshold from four times foundation budget to maybe two times. And I know that this is really, really far off the radar because it's a small program, but it could have a dramatic effect. We're already, as of halfway through this year, we've expended 117% of our budget for this fiscal year. So we've already spent more than $200,000 over our full year budget. That's a fifth of the money we received in the last override. Um, and, it's, and again, it's off the radar for most people, but it have a dramatic effect on our education funding. It's a high priority for us, and we're trying to, we'll try to get back to 100% funding of it as quickly as we can. Once we get there, then we can consider changes uh, in terms of the actual numbers that you're using, four times, two times, three times, whatever. But um, it's a, it is a very high priority. Program. Would you think that's a, it moving the target higher than 75%? Is that something that would be proposed Not until this year? Not funded and, and stable. And I don't remember where we are in relation to full time with that program. One more question. One more question. Heather Cameron is from Better Now. So go for it. Hi. I just want to know you, you raise the gas tax, the cigarette tax, and all those taxes. Can you, can you do an alcohol tax? We did, but it was repealed by the voters. Well, when, why can't the voters repeal the cigarette tax and all those others? They're going to try to repeal the. Uh, uh, the to me, that would be a place. It's going on the ballot to repeal the inflationary factor on the gas tax. Really? Not by our choice, but by the choice. I know there are other questions, um, and perhaps our citizens would say a few extra minutes, but we really did want to make mm -hmm. good on our commitment to um, get people going and pent out a few closing yeah. words, but and thank you so much. Part of, our, part of my closing is to have Deborah give an announcement about parallel efforts that, that uh, point to some of the points that have been raised here. Yeah. So why don't you make a brief um, announcement on that? Just quickly, there is a, a sort of cross-district group that's forming to address um, a lot of education issues, a lot of education policy issues, and one of which is funding. Um, not only kind of looking at the current revenue terms of funding, but also looking particularly at charter school funding and the money that that gains from our local system. Um, and so right now the group um, has representatives from all the schools um, in the district and there's teachers and parents um, and they're, they're sort of working groups. You can choose to focus on funding if you want. We're also working on high stakes testing and some other issues. Um, but if you're interested in either finding out more or joining a listserv, please see me and I can get you. Deborah Thank you. So, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. Here's what I want to say. I think we can take tremendous encouragement from the fact that there are 50 people in this room on a mid-January night with no crisis, but with commitment, with commitment to see change happen. And that is awesome. You are awesome. We together are awesome with all of us, literally, from elected official to constituent to citizen of Northampton. I really believe we can make a very real and concrete difference, and we are on our way, literally, right now. We don't have an override on the horizon this year. We don't have it on the horizon next year. We are not in a state of alarm. Of, well, we actually are in a constant state of alarm. <laughs> but, um, but barring that, meaning, you know, we're under, way so underfunded for so long, we are in a constant state of alarm. But we are, we are afloat in that alarm, and we are in a position to be methodical, and strategic and cohesive as we move forward. And this is a critical, critical first step. So I really want to give all of us a round of applause to be here. I just think it's awesome. And one concrete thing that we can look to immediately is January 29th. There's a governor's a gubernatorial candidate forum here in Northampton. Every single candidate running for governor as I understand it, is going to be here at Northampton. Democrat. 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 Right. It's a bias, but that's where our potential line. Um, okay, so that is January 29th at 7 p.m. at Northampton High School. Let's show up. That is really concrete about what we can do, and yes, Northampton will be, we can be us and as individuals and us as yes, Northampton, saying, here's what we expect of, of you as you are looking at your campaign. Here's what we're looking to. 
in your race? Are you willing to lead us on progressive tax reform? That's very real, very meaningful. Let's show up there. And then meanwhile, <coughs> stay tuned for, you know, is everyone here, did, is everyone here on the Yes from Hampton email list? If anyone is not, you, Jane has. Yeah, we have some other over here. And while you're eating our delicious cookies and drinking our seltzer so we don't have to take it home, we'll get you Sunday. So just <laughs> being connected as we <laughs> march forward in these coming months and this year is, is also number one priority. So thank you all for being here. It's really thank inspiring you. and onward. <laughs>